Mulweni, Dumalang, Sambonani, and welcome to the Avrik podcast, a podcast that aims to bring clarity to the concept of violence and its consequences in the lives of victims and survivor groups, as well as the perpetrators and their descendants. In this episode, Professor Heidi Grunebaum lectures on Between Memory and Cruelty on the Failure of Post-Apartheid Lament. Professor Heidi Grunebaum is a writer and academic um, and, di- and director of the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape. Her work focuses on the afterlives of genocide, war, and forced displacement, and on the relationship between art and politics. She is author of Memorial- Memorializing the Past, Everyday-, Everyday Life in South Africa After the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in two- 2011, co-editor of Uncontained, Opening the Community Art Project Archive, and Athlone in Mind 2017, amongst other writings. With Mark J. Kaplan, she made the documentary film The Village Under the Forest on the Palestinian Nakba, and she's currently making a second documentary film with, pa- with Kaplan set in Germany, on the weaponization of Jewish memory politics. So, um, I'd like to pass around um, a photograph. The photograph, um, maybe I shouldn't explain it. Before um, showing a one minute film clip from Kaganov's film, um, I would like to read a dedication. This is dedicated to the miners and migrants who toll every day beneath the earth, hidden in worlds of labor and extraction that created this South Africa, this Southern Africa. And for the slaves whose immaterial labor created its first city, this first city. August 16 marks 10 years since one of the longest minor strikes in South Africa's history, which culminated in the police killing of 34 striking miners and wounding 80 more at the Vondekop Hill near Marikana. This was a cataclysm of the post-apartheid that signaled a seismic shift for the promise of South Africa's hard-won freedom. For those who recall where they were and what they were doing on hearing the news of the massacre that cold midwinter's day, one sense of time's flow was punctured. Nine years earlier, a different temporal and spatial rupturing took place in Cape Town. Land excavations for a corporate real estate development uncovered a vast 18th century burial ground in Greenpoint near the city center. The Prestwich burial ground was the largest slave burial ground ever to be unearthed in the Southern Hemisphere. Nearly 3,000 bodies were accounted for, from babies, the children of slave washerwomen, to men in their late 60s. Prompted by two works of art, the experimental non-narrative short film by Arian Kaganov titled Threnody for the Victims of Marikana, and a theatre piece by Nadia Davids, directed by Jay Pather, called What Remains, 
I would like to try and think about these two moments of rapture, discontiguous in time and space, in which only in death were the miners at Marikana and the unearthed slaves in Cape Town granted temporarily a certain kind of status as human, a certain kind of human subjectivity. I understand this marking of humanity only in death as a civil disregard of the living and for the living. Many genres of ritual performance and aesthetic inscription of the embodied experience of loss express or approximate the searing of grief sorrow. Plaints, dirges, threnodies, eulogies, laments, panegyrics, elegies. However, I wish to think about lament as a public form, as a civil genre, rather than about those that express even publicly private grief or mourning or melancholia. So very differently to the kinds of public expressions of grief and lament that often and famously were um, presented and performed um, spontaneously at the human rights violations hearings of the Truth Commission, um, which I see as private expressions in public. So I'm really interested in thinking about a form of lament that is a civil genre. In this frame, attempting to threnodize the victim of the massacre at Marikana and the slaves at Prestwich burial ground in Cape Town could be understood as marking the failure of a civil imagination of the living in the post-apartheid. And I use the term post-apartheid as a collective, as an abstract noun to signal a state of being together apart in a time and place marked by the defeat of legal and political apartheid and simultaneously the continuities of apartheid. Apartheid also as um, a special form of settler colonialism. I borrow from visual theorist Ariella Azulai's call for a reconceptual, a reconceptualization of political imagination. Azulai revisits the notion of citizenship as, quote, a dimension of being governed, and suggests how it may dismantle distinctions between privileged citizens, discriminated citizens, and non-citizens. And I think this is a very useful way to think, particularly the contemporary conjuncture globally and in South Africa, where being marked as a non-citizen um, can often be a, 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 a marking for death. The activation of a civil imagination, an activation she, that's prompted in her work by the work of photography, might open a space of relations between the governed quote, whose political duty is first and foremost, or at least also, a duty toward one another, rather than toward the ruling power. It is the general absence of such relations of political duty between the governed that registers the failure of a civil lament for the killed miners of the Marikana massacre and the dead slaves of the Prestwich burial grounds, and that mark the limits of a civil imagination or its absence for the living. And perhaps these transversal relations are pointed to in the epigraph to the writer's and director's notes in the published booklet as a bo um, for the second staging of What Remains, which was held was staged at Heading Hall in June, July 2017. The first staging was um, uh, at the Little Theatre, also at UCT in 2016. All that is buried is not dead, reads the epigraph from Olive Schreiner's story of an African farm, raising the question of the relationship between the governed as one that is animated and opened through the encounter between the arts with the long duration of apartheid's multiple forms of violence, systemic, ordinary, and spectacular. In her reading of Homer's accounts of burial rituals and grieving practices in the writing of Zaik Da, 
Elika Steinmeier notes that the threnody is a, gr a genre of ritual lament that is. So, Elika Stein Steinmeier notes that the threnody is a genre of ritual lament that is sung. In other words, it's sonic and it's musical, distinct from the personal dirges as expressions of grief at funeral threnodies were a form of oral poetry sung by professional mourners and later a musical form expressing grief comprising general content about loss rather than personal aspects of, um, of the dead that relate to the personal loss brought by their death. This was in contrast to the personal details offered in spoken dirges, which constituted the ritual laments of the bereaved families of the dead. As a sung and musical form of lament, the threnody therefore has a public and civil function. Viewed differently to the personal dirge, the threnody stands as a collective act, noting and commemorating the dead in the civil domain. A threnody then requires a civil discourse of life, as well as a civil practice of regard in, for the living in order for it to perform its function of marking a death. The life of the dead would need to have been apprehended as such, as part of a civil domain of life, beyond a biopolitics which, as Sylvia Winters reminds us, um, is founded on multiply partitioned taxonomies and hierarchies of separation, including ecocide. The life of the dead would need to be perceived and apprehended as more than being irreducible to the categories of migrant worker, of minor or slave. Kakanov's non-narrative film, Threnody for the Victims of Marikana, was made in response to a conference called Hearing Landscape Critically, which was a conference at Stellenbosch in 2013. In its cinematic remixing of visual, acoustic, and sensorial fields, the film through its form, and you kind of get that from the, um, the opening clip, through its form, registers the absence of the conditions of possibility necessary to constitute a threnody for the dead, the conditions of possibility that might foster a civil regard for the living. In its attempt to theorize through Marikana rather than theorize about Marikana, threnody blows the space between the viewer and between the viewer and the film. And as the non-narrative film unfolds, this entangled relationship that emerges in the blurring uh, implicates the viewer. The film opens a way to think about complicity as one way, or in Michael Rothberg's formulation, uh, implicatedness, as, as one way to respond to the absence of a civil imagination, as one way to start committing to imagining what uh, a civil imagination of the living might look and feel and be like. To do this, the musical genre of public grief, which is the threnody, is translated in the film into a cinematic form. And the way that this is done unbinds the massacre as an episode or an event in order to surface these relations of implication that extend far beyond the viewer and the, the footage. If the film avoids the term massacre in its title, it not only brings the eventness of the massacre under scrutiny, it discerns the relation between the long durations of apartheid systemic racialized violence, aesthetics and complicity that together enable us to rethink a shared political imagination as well as, I think, a thicker conception of time and duration. Nadia David's play script, What Remains, addresses the uncovering of the Prestwich burial ground, initially written as a novella, and this is important because it, 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 it's finally staged as live art. In a series of workshops with Jay Patha and the performers, the work was reworked into a performance text, divided into 12 parts, each part corresponding 
with uh, one of the theses from um, John Burgess' uh, 12 Theses on the Economy of the Dead. The four characters around whom the conflict centers are archetypes, the healer, the archeologist, the narrator, who later was transformed into the student, um, and the chairman, who was later the chairwoman. As archetypes, these characters are allegorical translations and allow for a capaciousness and an extension of, um, of these types into other settings from New York to Detroit to Jaffa to Berlin and elsewhere. But they also um, translate the specificities of the burial grounds history and geography and stand in for the constituencies and claims in the public contestations that ensued with the uncovering of the slave site. A dancer was brought into the performance whose presence connected, separated, and threaded the 12 parts, embodying and moving the unworded, the unspoken remainders of past and present, dead and living, into the ruins of the now. Through the 12 parts of the play, the metaphoricity of the rapturing of the earth by the developers' bulldozers to expose the buried slaves at the heart of the city thicken through the interaction between the characters and the dancer and the audience. What Remains was transformed into a play script after David sensed that there was something about the form of the text that wasn't quite working, something about text and inscription. And as a, as a writer who's been making and thinking for many years with the idea that performance and memory are intertwined, that they are each other's echoes, and that no, she says no other art forms, I disagree, um, are as uniquely placed to evoke memory, to represent it, to bring it in, into a conversation with the, play, with the present. David's reworking of the novella into a play script recognizes the collective, collaborative, but also ephemeral and communal uh, attitude of live art and its possibility to constitute a transient time space in which lament as a communal and civil endeavor might be constituted. In his director's notes, Jay Pather writes of the architecture of the staging as one that structured the possibility for an encounter in which looking across the room at a row of spectators watching like you, like you, histories playing out. You may identify a perpetrator of catastrophe or even an ally. And so there's something about like you, watching as you are watching, but someone who, with whom you identify mm -hmm. that I think I would like to um, kind of unpack. Because in thinking about um, Threnody with and through the arts and of lament as a way to build another way, another civil practice of being together apart across the separation that marks um, asymmetrically the everyday in the present. Um, to, to think against the logics of apartheid and its organizing kind of um, psychic architectures, laws of perception, as um, Njabulo Ndebele describes these, um, I think is, is, is a, if I may say it as strongly, an obligation. Complicity in foldedness, the refusal of an outside or a bounded narrative, function as motifs of the limits of civil relations that are threaded both through the structure of Threnody, the film, and what remains, the play. From the perspective of the camera in Threnody, the footage that forms the bulk of the visual bed is that of the point of view of the police. The viewer only sees the act of killing through a state-aligned perspective, and I'm playing there with um, Joshua Oppenheimer's kind of film, The Act of Killing, but also thinking about, um, about how the point of view um, of the film footage of the Marikana massacre is only accessible through the footage that was filmed while the police were shooting. 
To view the police footage of the killing again and again makes the view an accomplice in the repeated obliteration of the murder murdered men. There can be no shared perspective with the dead, nor is there a shared perspective of their lives if they are excluded from a practice of civil imagination of the living. Although categories of worker and minor crucially lodge a political and social subject who claim visibility, collective rights and recognition, these categories are inadequate to the task of the network of relations and obligations that a civil, Im that a civil imagination would constitute. The film comments on the ways in which structures of social organization compose and maintain a distribution of the sensible across the domain of the visible, sayable, hearable. The legend in the opening credits of the film, Made in a Police State, remind of uh, Jacques Rancière's term, uh, the police order, a term that he uses to describe the institutional organization and social arrangement of power that partition the senses. And this is both hauntingly resonant and ironically apt. In its experiment with composition, a term borrowed from the aesthetic domain of the sonic, of music, Threnody suggests that the sensibilities of public perception in post-apartheid South Africa therefore exclude the sense of mutual civil regard. At the same time, the use of decomposition of sound and image suggests an undoing and reconfiguration of the domains of the senses to which sound and visual image are conventionally made to correspond. So a practice of civil imagination would re require both an aesthetic education of the kind that Gayatri Spivak imagines and asks for us to imagine uh, in order to inhabit the fragmented, interconnected contemporary and an aesthetic endeavor that defamiliarizes the made invisible, including the givenness of the geopolitical framings of imagined national spaces that are, we are often imagined as somehow discrete and self-contained, separate from the networks of trade, movement, migration, capital, and informational flows. Comprised of two movements, the film borrows, swaps, and inverts the terms of musical arrangement very importantly, the beginning section has a voiceover that um, is read by the poet, artist, activist Lefifi Tladi, uh, which is a translation from Jesus Supel, Supelvida, uh, his garden, wait, uh, the garden of particularities. He's a Chilean writer and poet. Um, it's a kind of anarchist manifesto, um, a really interesting manifesto, and Lefifi Cladi translates this into into Sutu, um, sorry, into Tswana, and he re, he voices the Tswana translation of this manifesto that links the kind of ur laboratory of neoliberalism Chile um, to South Africa in a gesture that insists on extending the imagination of uh, implication. Um, that the Marikana ma massacre sh should be considered inside of, and widens the circles of reference and interconnection. So in, if the aesthetic remaking of landscape constitutes a significant process in the ideological remaking of conquered and partitioned lands into new and in South Africa now supposedly more inclusive national homelands, landscape cannot be only an aesthetic vision of ideological and embodied attachments imposed on an existing national surface, eliding the strata beneath. With the appearance of the slaves' bodies at the burial ground, a temporal interruption, um, a temporal interruption had been effected inaugurating a different conception of time. A time for naming, a time for the dead, and in their wake, a time for assimilating the extent of accumulated effects of social destruction, premised on the active destruction of mnemonic traces. Such mnemonic traces enable a futural, or would have enabled a futural orientation for memory work. In the case of the burial ground, this work included naming, recalling, questioning, deferring. The civic campaign to halt 
to halt exhumation was located along a temporal fault line that revealed the causal connections between social impact of a rapidly shifting urban landscape <clears throat> and highly compressed temporalities of, globe, of property development in global time. The campaign called for a slowing down of the development machine in order for a social and historical reckoning to begin. Underlying this call was an acknowledgement of the tensions that inhere between the temporalities of constituting a civil imagination that would engage the afterlives of slavery, of migrant work, of mining in the post-apartheid, and the temporalities of development, of healing, of moving on, that structure historical denial and its modes of complicity. The time for the dead, however, as a counter time, as another possibility to kind of produce some notion of a civil imagination, was premised on the bodies remaining in the burial ground, on the burial ground being consecrated as such. It was premised on the necessity that the open ground and the bodies buried there remained intact, in integrity and visible as a burial ground, even one that had been marked as forgotten, that had been built over, that erupted from the beneath as a mnemonic of the erasure of the life of the slaves and of their debts. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For more, you can check out our website.